Good evening. My name is Norman Alexander from the Richrest Area Association of Realtors, and I'd like to welcome you to 2020's Indian Wells Valley Water District Board of Directors Candidate Forum. Before we get started, I'd like to have everyone stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight is the first of three public service candidate forums being presented by the Richcrest Chamber of Commerce, the Richcrest Area Association of Realtors, and the Indian Wells Valley Economic Development Corporation. We thank the city of Richcrest for making this venue available for these important forums. I want to welcome the candidates for the Indian Wells Valley Water District Board of Directors um, starting on my far right, Mallory Boyd, Chuck Griffin, Andrew Gitzko, and Ron Sosinski. Um, Charles Cordell is not here. Um, he had a, he, uh, sorry you can't be here, but he's in the hospital with a slight heart issue. The doctor's prognosis is that he will make a full recovery. Um, we will be sending him the questions later. He'll be answering them and be in the press. All righty. I welcome your, I also welcome the virtual community who are viewing online. And now I will turn it over to the two moderators for this forum. Hello, I'm Scott O'Neill, Executive Director of the Indian Wells Valley Economic Development Corporation. And I'm Tim Smith, the Executive Director at the Chamber of Commerce, the Ridgecrest Chamber of Commerce, I should say. We'd like to start by reviewing the rules for this event, which is being streamed live to the public. It is also being recorded, so it can be viewed later via the city website. Scott, turn your mic off. Thanks. Um, our goal in sponsoring this forum is to give you a chance to share with the public some information about yourself, your motivations, and your views. It's also to give us, as representatives of our community, a chance to um, ask you some important water-related questions. In preparation, we have sought such questions from our community. The questions we will ask are synthesized from these submittals. Each of you will be given a chance to respond to each question asked. Initially, each candidate will give, be given three minutes for an opening statement. We hope you'll take this time to tell us about yourself, your qualifications, your motivation for running, and if elected, any ideas you're gonna to bring to the post. After these introductions, we'll move to the question and answer session. The questions will be, will be addressed, and they'll be posted on the screen for your reference and uh, for the public's reference. Each candidate will be given a dedicated time to respond to each, to each question asked. The amount of time allotted will be announced at the, end of each, at, at the asking of each question. To be fair, each candidate will have an opportunity to be first to respond to a question. A random draw is used to select who will start the response to the first question. And that'll be Chuck Griffin. And then we'll proceed um, in sequence to the, to the candidate's left, to, to the viewer's right, uh, based on how they sit, chose to seat. We anticipate asking five questions. However, if time allows, we may ask another. We expect each of you to be cordial, respectful, and mannered in, every, in your responses. If you choose to target another candidate, after you complete your response, we will give that candidate 30 seconds for rebut. So each will be given, so please keep this in mind. At the end of the forum, each candidate will be given one minute to share any final thoughts or reasons as to why the public should vote for you.
with five questions nominally, we should be done in 95 minutes. Uh, tonight, Rebecca McCourt from the IWV EDC and Donna Hawker from RAR will be our timers. They're going to be sitting out there. And uh, would you ladies stand um, so that they know who you are just in case? So when the time is, um, they'll be able to flag you. We also have the electronic uh, digital time up on the, on the wall that I'm going to try to keep on track as well. When you see one of them stand during your remarks, that is the, your indicator that you have 30 seconds remaining. So when you see them stand, please wrap up your comments. Okay, one final comment. For many of the questions that we're gonna ask, we have added some rhetorical questions or comments to help you understand the underlying intent of the question being asked. Use this information as you choose, but please direct your response towards our intent. Okay, so let's jump into the first question. Chuck, first up to you. You're going to have... Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Go for it, Chuck. Okay, we're going to start with introductions then. Is that a little loud or is that okay? Okay. Um, my name is Chuck Griffin. Um, first, I would like to thank um, the Realtors Association, the Chamber, and the Economic Development Corporation for hosting this tonight. And then second, I'd like to thank the city for allowing us to have this meeting during this pandemic. Um, and I would hope the city will consider allowing the water district to have their future meetings here also until they can come up with a recording session or some kind of video that they could stream for their meetings. Um, I've been a lifelong resident of Ridgecrest. I was born and raised here. Uh, my dad was born here and my grandfather came here in the early 40s. So we've been here um, a long time. Um, I have a wonderful wife, Rhonda. We have, together we have six kids, nine grandchildren. Um, so this community is very important to me. Um, the water issues um, here and in Trona, as some of them live in Trona, so I'm very concerned about that area also. Um, it is very critical. I think we're in one of the most critical stages that we've been in in a long time in this valley, and that is how do we promote growth with water issues? And I think growth's important. Um, and we've got to face these challenges that are placed in front of us through the current Sigma with the GSA. So I'm asking for your vote. I think I can do a great job. I was a pr past member um, of the Water District Board. I served a four year term. And I believe my opinion was there. I'm very strong voiced. I'm gonna say how I feel rather People like it or they don't. I'm going to say what I feel. Um, but I'm asking for your vote. And then one last thing I would like to say is Chuck Cordell. I spoke with him prior to the meeting just minutes before. Um, he's very dear to me, so I would ask you to say a little prayer for him. Um, he's, he means a lot to me, and I'm very concerned about him. So I'm sorry he couldn't be here tonight. Hi, so my name is Andrew Getzko. Oh, oh. There we go. Andrew Getzko. Um, I've been an attorney for 10 years. I moved here to Ridgecrest uh, about three years ago. I graduated from the University of Denver Sturm College of Law in 2010. I have a technical background with five years in the Air Force with a Bachelor in Science and Associates in Applied Science. Um, I have an active and varied volunteer record as well. I was volunteer for multiple HOA boards, uh, and nonprofit boards, uh, child advocate both as a guardian ad litem and working with Head Start programs. So I've been active in the community most of my life. I also do a lot of extra volunteer and mentoring and helping people with tech projects, stuff like that as well. Um, I'm highly analytic and I do believe that my skills and background will be really very valuable in addressing a lot of the water issues that we're facing. I'm, I registered uh, as a candidate basically to offer myself as a public servant. Um, I do believe that this is a public service and we're here to help the people and represent the people and ensure a stable community. My goal is to build up this community and ensure that that stable future is guaranteed for generations to come. By all accounts, we do have a limited amount of water and we do live in a desert. And no matter how much water we do have, I do believe that every last drop will be claimed by somebody no matter what we do. So there will always be tension, at least for the foreseeable future. I will work first at addressing a lot of these short-term problems, at helping be a big voice for the community, offering clarity and transparency for all members. And for the priorities in leadership, I want to have clear and transparent information, fair solutions, and stable future. 
on clear and transparent information, I understand that it's very difficult to understand a lot of these water issues. It is a complex situation. And even once we find out where these issues are located, where the documentation is located, a lot of individuals may have trouble following a lot of the stuff. It's very technical documentation. One of the big things I'm pushing for is clarity within the website and a lot of access that simplifies that communication and encourages community access. I want it to be easier to participate. I want it to be easier to hear how the community members feel and make it easier for them to understand exactly what our situations and options are. In terms of the fairness, I believe that that is a core factor of moving forward. It will be extremely frustrating for people if they feel that their water issues are not being addressed in a fair manner. It's already frustrating that we have an increase in water that's coming and seen as inevitable. When a solution comes across as unfair, it harms the community, it increases the likelihood of prolonged litigation, and it undermines the confidence that we can have in our community leaders. That is one of our core factors forward in building that stable future. I believe that when we look for solutions, we can look for win-win solutions. That includes state infrastructure projects that can be benefiting our community. That includes federal infrastructure projects, and this is, of course, long-term, even beyond the term that we're being elected for here. I want to look at stable futures that allow collaborative involvement that can build that stable infrastructure, not just saying that we have to all come up with this money out of our pocket. To sum it all up, we do need leadership that is here for the community and encourages participation from the community. We need fair solutions that are clear and transparent so that we can ensure that stable future that we all seek. Thank you. Thank you. I want to re reiterate what Chuck said. I want to first of all thank uh, the Ridgecrest Area Association of Realtors, the IWB Economic Development, and Ridgecrest uh, Chamber of Commerce, as well as the city, and a shout out to Gary back there. He works really hard. Thank you, Gary. <clears throat> Excuse me. About my uh, background, my name is Ron Kosinski. I'm a 30-year resident and property owner of Inniewells Valley. I hold a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, dated 1975, that shows my age, from Rose Holman Institute of Technology in Terre Haute, Indiana. I'm a licensed professional engineer in California. I've also been licensed in Louisiana and Colorado. Um, I have 22 plus years managing multi-million dollar design and construction projects. Uh, my wife and I are successful small business owners for over 30 years in Ridgecrest. I've been a director of the 5030 Agricultural District. You all know it is a Desert Empire Fair for nine years, with six years as the board president. I was a director on the Chamber of Commerce for seven years with two terms as board president. I'm presently on the, uh, I'm sorry, present director for the Indianapolis Valley Water District, and I'm presently the Indianapolis Valley Water District appointed to groundwater authority. And also, I'm proud to have adopted three rescue border collies. Two of them are blind, and one is really smart. <laughs> They're probably watching tonight. As for, as for my goals for the district, I believe in financial stability. It's important to assure the financial health of the Indian Valley's water district. We must continue to maintain the AA minus standard and poor's rating at a minimum. This will allow the district to access capital project funding as necessary to assure the ability to perform capital equipment replacement, plant upgrades, and modernization and new development projects. We must also assure that we have a sound infrastructure. We must continue to maintain its operating facilities to the highest standards. This will assure the ability to provide services in all situations, such as last year's earthquakes or possible long-term outages, power outages. This includes, this includes recruiting and retention of the best employees possible as seen by the present operation and customer service. We have a great crew over there. I also believe that we need to continue to look for a reliable source of water. We have to provide quality water for continued support and future growth of the community, the Navy base, businesses, and public institutions. The idea, so we, we must seek sources of water that will fulfill these needs while supporting the long-term sustainability of our water aquifer for generations to come. Finally, I'm going to use my engineering and project management skills, as well as my understanding of complex financial issues and management practices to ensure a reliable, adequate supply of quality water to sustain and grow our community. Uh, I feel it's a duty to give back to a community that has contributed so much to Sharon's and my success in this valley. We have built a home here and plan to stay. We are not leaving. And the last thing I'd like to say is I know that uh, this position we're running for is director of the Indian Wells Valley Water District, and there will be plenty of questions about the groundwater authority. 
Um, bear with me or bear with all of us up here because sometimes they get intermixed, but I want to make it clear those are two different organizations. A lot of people don't know that. Thank you. Am I coming through? Is this on? Hello. I'm Mallory Boyd, and I am a Indian Wells Valley native. I'm not on. How's that? Oh, there we go. I don't have to lean so far forward. Hi. I'm Mallory Boyd. I'm an Indian Wells Valley native beginning my wonderful life experience here in 1953. I attended local schools, graduated from Burroughs in 1971, uh, then volunteered to, su to support the armed services uh, for four years during the Vietnam conflict. Uh, then off to college, I earned my bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering, and after which I returned to China Lake for a 36-year uh, wonderful technical career. Uh, I have extensive e uh, leadership and training and practical experience. I successfully led various research and development organizations at China Lake requiring complex decision-making long-term business strategies. I was considered an entrepreneur due, due to my successful engagement with unknown business partners, turning them into advocates and supporters. Successfully dealing with people who are not inclined to help you achieve your objective is very challenging especially when the success of your business depends upon your own personal success. I keep informed about local political efforts as I serve on the board of directors for the China Lake Alliance, and I also keep informed about water issues as a member of the Groundwater Authority Technical Advisory Committee. I think this unique set of skills and experiences and insights bless me with the ability to deal with complex problems that are similar to what the IWV faces regarding our groundwater challenges. My aspirations, first and foremost, we must set a course immediately to shore up our water situation. We cannot, further, we cannot afford further delay. Securing an important water source is step one. Details not currently understood will become clearer as time passes. Many efforts are currently underway to address many of these details. Of course, conservation and recycling need to be front and center as well. Second, we need a valley-wide water strategy, including the Water District, City of Ridgecrest, Groundwater Authority, Ridgecrest Realtors, Navy, Searles Valley, and Inyo Kern and San Bernardino County representatives as signatories. This strategy needs public visibility as well. We cannot afford for these agencies to act unilaterally anymore, especially if their decisions have water impacts. They need to reach consensus on water use priorities and how best to get there. Third, our community has been subjected to what I would consider a partial information campaign that leaves many reluctant to believe in community leadership. This needs to be corrected through improved public outreach and communications. Continued public education in these areas of water need to be considered an essential part of our strategy. Growth, while I do not envision or desire community sprawl reminiscent to Southern California, I do believe in growth but we have to do it within the bounds of a sustainably managed water supply. We currently do not have enough water to sustain our current way of life, much less embrace growth. We need imported water. We now have a better understanding of the limits of our water basin and how much we will be able to withdraw under state-directed management. As we continue to study and collect more groundwater health data under the GA direction, our plan of action will need to adjust. Regular and continued engagement will be paramount. That's Okay, so now we're going to start the question and answer session. And um, I'm just going to go over, you know, that last comment again, just for your reference. So, so the questions can be kind of complex, and so we've added some rhetorical information to help you understand the underlying intent of the question. And so use this information as you choose, but please direct your response towards the intent of the question. So, okay, let's jump into question number one. Chuck, you get to start off with this particular question. You'll have three minutes to respond. There are many complex issues facing wa the water district, and critical thinking is important. What is your approach to developing solutions to complex problems? Provide a brief example of how you used this skill in the past. For example, you tend to, do you tend to base your position in the subjective or the objective case? How do you value the role of data or science in this regard? How does the need for transparency play? How do you form the best solution regarding the common good? 
Are opinions good enough or should the board work to develop a unified position on such topics? Again, you have three minutes. Well, you asked more than one question there in that little I mean. paragraph. So um, there are a lot of complex issues facing the water district. Um, critical thinking has to be used. Um, and you have to work together with the board, but I do not believe that reaching a unified decision and then all voting the same way is absolutely the best way to go. I think that's why you have a five member board or a seven member board so you can be individual and all work together with different solutions to a problem. And so I think being an individual on a board is also important and working together but to always have the same outcome as a unified board on a vote, I, I disagree with that. I think that you're not always gonna have that. Um, let's see, do you tend to base your positions? I think I'm objective. Um, I wanna look at all of the answers when I try to make a decision. How do you value the role of data or science in this regard? I, I think science is very important but in this basin, I don't think we have enough science. I think that we need to do a much more testing. We need to drill some large wells, develop them, do some test pumping in the south area, because I believe there's water in that area. And we need a lot more testing. That, that is my opinion. There, I know we have some science there, but we have different opinions on the science. There's different reports. Right now, everything is being based off of the Todd report. And so I, I disagree with some of that. I, I think science is, the, is important, but we need more science here. Um, transparency is the, one of the biggest issues that I see. That's, we have to have transparency. Everything needs to be open to the public. The board meetings uh, is one of my critical things. I, I asked when I was previously on the board, we need to have these meetings recorded and broadcasted. Um, and I'm still asking that. I, I think it's very important to have the meetings on the internet or on channel six or whatever we can do so the public can see what's going on and be open as a board. It, it, there doesn't need to be secrets. Uh, whatever is going on should be able to be discussed in a meeting. That's how I feel. Um, the best solu how do you form the best solution regarding the common good? I think you have to work together. Um, I think you have to be able to set down across from each other and talk. And I think communication is probably the best solution for that. And are opinions good enough or should the board work to develop unified positions? I think I answered that. So I think I hope I answered your question. Yeah. All right, I wanna make sure everyone can hear me. I did get some feedback that there was some trouble hearing. So. Oh. All right. Um, to address these questions, I agree that they're complex issues. Um, as to the agreement or unanimity of the board, I think it depends on context. If we're asking questions like what's two plus two or you know, science-based questions that are fairly simple, I would hope that we can have a unified decision. When we deal with science or being subjective versus objective, I think we need to be as objective as we can be, but that also means identifying ambiguity or the things that we don't know. I don't wanna to rush to a decision and say it's a science-based decision because 50% of our data says this is the answer. I wanna really look into it and say, well, here's the ambiguity, here's where that possibility lies. So we know this much about a situation. It can go back and forth a little bit. And I think the issue we have a lot of times in the community is that little bit of ambiguity gets interpreted as if we don't know what the solutions are gonna be. So science-based decisions, I feel if that's not the way we go, the only alternative is really an interest-based decision. And I feel that a lot of times that leaves the community out, especially when we don't always have the voices that we need. With, uh, with the approach to the water, I do feel that we need a lot better data. I think, you know, I agree 100% with Chuck on that idea. We can look at other water districts and how they're using some of the technology. We can see what the costs are and if we can get some similar things. I was watching some of the water board meetings where people are saying, we're gonna estimate the usage here, or we're gonna guess on this there. And I feel that those types of decisions leave a lot of room for harm that can go unnoticed for a significant amount of time. 
if we believe that this is an extremely rare resource and we don't protect it by ensuring that people aren't you know, acting in an underhanded manner or something, I believe we're setting ourselves up for failure. I mean, if this really is that critical of a resource, I can only see that if we allow people to get away with doing something, there's every incentive to do that. Thank you. I'm going to take your advice, Scott, and stick to the question as best I can and try not to interpret other things out of it. But I want to say this. You know, when it comes to uh, developing solution approaches, I've, I've always been uh, very objective. I, I do s some subjective analysis, but I'm a very pragmatic person. That's from my engineering background. Uh, I'm data-driven. I will listen to all the opinions, use those opinions as, as, as best I can to come to a final decision, and be very analytical about the, the solution. Uh, you, you also asked for a brief description of how we've used the skills in the past. I think the recent uh, workshops from the Inuel Valley Water District concerning water acquisition and also wastewater and wastewater treatment, uh, uh, which uh, I've driven most of that through the Water Management Committee, and I think it's a very important thing to, to continue on, and we will continue to push for that. Uh, uh, the role of, like I just said, the role of data or science, uh, both of them play a very important part. Um, just to touch on, uh, off the, I won't say it's off the subject because it says it was brought up before, that there is a vast amount of data on this valley. It's been studied for well over 100 years, most recently in 2018 with the recharge studies. So for, for when I hear people say we haven't had the data, we're making maybe this, maybe that, and we're guessing at this, sometimes that, that hits home because I've been involved in it. I'm a very data-driven person, but I do believe that we need to continue to search for more data and improve our bank of data that we have to refine any project that we have. So in forming the best solution, I, th I think all those things can come into, a, don't come into play. And like I said, including everyone's opinion and analysis, all that needs to be taken into account. Um, and do you need a particular board to have a complete unified position on such topics? Not at all. But I do believe that whatever is agreed upon by that board, that the full board supports it. Thank you. Am I still on? Yay. Um, <clears throat> interesting question. Uh, I tend to be analytical. Uh, I do believe in science. Uh, I spent a lot of my career working in and around areas of science that relied upon solid data collections and analyses. Um, but there's a couple of kind of esoteric terms I like to deal with as well. And when I look at problems and complex problems, uh, I like to start with the end in mind. It's just, it helps me ground w what I'm trying to do. And I might have a picture of what the future is in a case where I'm starting with the end in mind, or I might not. If I don't, I need to develop one and then consider what are the challenges of getting to that future point. It may not be just my picture of the future, it may be somebody else's, but what do we need to do to get there? Um, and I also form a, a, a big believer in form follows function. Uh, I think that's foundational. It helps you understand and lay out what is important and what isn't important as you're dealing with decisions about where to focus your time and efforts, which are always limited, no matter how simple or complex the problems are. Um, so do we have a role of data in science? Yes. Uh, is there ever enough data? No. <laughs> are science opinions uh, controversial? Yeah. I mean, all these things have degrees of uncertainty about them that we need to strive towards shoring those up. Uh, for example, 7650 acre feet of water is our estimate for the annual recharge into the valley. That might not be right. It might be less. It might be more. We don't know, but we will know over time as we continue to collect data, continue to put more wells in place to and analyze what our inflows are and come up with a better picture of how much water the state um, sustainability initiative is going to require us to live with them. If we get stuck living with 7650, this, this community is going to be a lot different than it looks today. Um, but nonetheless, so starting with the end of mind, form follows function, collect the data, make sure the data is good, make sure your science that's being drawn from the data is solid. And, and then draw your conclusions from those.
Thank you. So as we begin our second question, we will begin with Andrew. I'll read you the question, and it'll also be on your screen. What do you believe is going to be the impact of the new state mandates on residential water consumption when they go into effect in June 2022? What could the water district do to mitigate state-imposed fines? You each will have two minutes to respond. All right, thank you. Um, I think that this is one of the big concerns I've had for a while. We are a community with a lot of evaporative coolers, and it uses a good amount of water. The good thing about this uh, mandate is that it doesn't designate all water use. It's talking about indoor usage that's been identified so far. We still have some external and some ability to potentially argue that we have a need, at least for the community. If we were to cut off that water limit, which, by the way, it opposes to the, or it, it applies to the water district. It's not per individual. So even though it's an individual mandate, it's not like you as an individual are going to have to pay X amount of money per acre foot because of that direct overage. That'll be something that would be handled as a fine against the water district and they would manage the fees and that would be pushed down from there. So that at least dilutes it, but we, we don't have much of a differential between a large water user uh, using entity and a small water user entity. Some of these fines can basically hit some of the smaller entities harder. The fact that we have that evaporative cooling means that we have some issues we need to address and we need to propose that this is untenable at least until we have something to address it. One of the things we could try to do is petition the state to have a uh, program for a grant or rebate to convert some of these items. However, I'm concerned that air conditioning is extremely expensive in the desert. These types of trade-offs are some of the things that I've been looking at as we deal with, you know, how we're going to approach a water future in a desert community. I think we need to try to argue that we need change from the state. We need a different solution that takes into account the actual needs of the community. I think some of the state regulations are tone deaf and I think it will face some challenges. Well, I can talk a lot on this one because it's coming forward. The Water District has been working on this. We've been working with DWR to try to be one of the test areas where they can determine the use for outside. There's two components of this. There's inside use which is presently going to be 55 gallons per day per person to drop to 50 gallons per day per person. But they have yet to develop the outside use that's going to be allowed in our valley. We've already spoken with DWR. They are looking at the idea that we, are, we do have swamp coolers and they're going to evaluate the desert area. So we don't know what the final number is yet. Uh, it is correct in saying that the only people that are going to pay to fine are those uh, public utilities, which is the water district. And uh, that could that could uh, be substantial, but to, like I said, we're working with the state the best we can to get the water usage where we need it. As far as evaporative coolers go, uh, the state has mandated that all new homes will be built with solar power that will help people uh, stick with uh, uh, refrigerated air. Uh, as I understand from many contractors I know, there hasn't been a home or a, a, a complex built here in the city for well over five years with uh, swamp coolers. Although there are many swamp coolers out there, the district has been continuing to look for ways that we can encourage people to switch over to um, energy efficient um, refrigerated units. So that is available to us out there. We're doing analysis now on, on how you can do that and how, how can we help people absorb that capital cost. And uh, we believe we can get there. But at this particular point, when you look at the evaporative coolers, that is dropping off very quickly in this, in this valley. Uh, one thing the district has going for us is we've had a 30% drop in water usage uh, over the years. Uh, I want to say since uh, 2007 till now, and we continue to have a 20% 20 20 or more water use compared to uh, drop compared to 2013. So the district, and I commend, I commend our ratepayers for the way they're, they're, they're adhering to the requirements for watering and xeriscaping. It is, is really paid off. Uh, we're going to continue to do it, though. Thank you. A lot of great thoughts. Uh, I won't spend time repeating them. I, I agree with most of what I just heard. Uh, with one exception, we did convert to uh, air conditioning a few years back. Uh, I had three master cool, uh, coolers on my home, uh, and my actual electricity cost went down when I went to an HVAC system. Now, I didn't have a very efficient master cool system. No plugs for master cool intended, but, um, but my electric bill did go down. 
uh, not substantially, but enough. Uh, I think part of the uh, uh, answers here involve, again, as we've, uh, several of us have mentioned the board already, is the public outreach. How can we help the public recognize what it can do individually to reduce its water uses? And you think of things back in days and past, I mean, Jimmy Carter talking about turning off the water when you're shaving and those kinds of things, right? Some people have suggested uh, uh, Navy showers, you know, where you lather up, you turn the water off, you, you, know, you do your thing, and then you rinse instead of running the water continuously the whole time. Think about how you use water when you're in your RV or when you're camping. There's a lot of things we do out there that we could use, you know, directly in, in the way that we conduct ourselves around the house if we were needed to do so. Now, I don't savor that kind of a future, but there are a lot of savings that we could all uh, appreciate there. The other piece, and I forget the name of the program, Ron, I think you touched on it, but there's been some resources reached uh, through the water district that would help offset some of the expenses of water saving technology uh, across the valley and to emphasize those and seek out other grant funding that would help us help people buy water saving toilets and other appliances and things would also be a way that we could reduce the water water demand. Thank you. Um, I agree with most all, everything also, as Mallory said. Um, there is a few differences. The uh, Speaking about the evaporative coolers, when I was on the board previously, we had a cash for grass program that was going on, and I had asked several times that I would like to see that program converted to a AC conversion instead of a cash for grass. I think it would be more beneficial hmm. to the actual user. Um, so I think that would be one of the first things the district needed to do was pursue doing a cash for evaporative coolers. If somebody turns in their cooler, they work on a grant program. The units now, you can buy one of the little Mitsubishi units or whatever for you know $1,200 or something, and th they will cool a room. So it's very economical now, and I, I think that is a benefit. But one of the biggest things I believe the district can do is it's hard for me to tell somebody, as Mallory said, to take a Navy shower when I know we have non-potable water that we could be using and we use potable water for construction projects and if we have, you know, the viewfinders, which I think is a wonderful event, but we're using potable water for those events and I've asked and I will continue to ask for the city to install a fill stand at the alfalfa fields to where we could use that water that they're watering alfalfa with to put into water trucks so we could spray it on the dirt so people can ride motorcycles. It makes sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me to say, you gotta take a Navy shower, but we're gonna use 200,000 gallons of water a day watering down the dirt when we have a non-potable stand that would work just fine. And that's what I would like to see happen. Um, the water waters the golf course on the base. It waters the alfalfa fields. I, I think it's possible to do, and I think that's one of the biggest issues. The water is going to become very expensive as the replenishment fee gets put into place for construction. And I think if we offered that out there at the fairgrounds to a discounted rate to contractors, it would make the prices go down on, when we give a quote to somebody. Okay, reference uh, the third question will be up on the screen also, so as I read it, uh, please uh, please t check your screen. Okay, this one will start off with, uh, with Ron, and um, question number three. The Indian Wells Valley Groundwater Authority has prepared a long-range groundwater sustainability plan for a basin. The Water District has been actively participating in this particular effort. Please share your thoughts on this participation and on some of the key elements of the plan itself. For example, pumping allocations, fees, emphasis on importation over other elements of the solution, local versus regional solution, water district's role in funding and carrying out future sustainability projects. You'll each have four minutes to address this question. Go on. Can everybody pass their time to me, please? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can go on and on about this one. But first of all, let's say the, the, the Water District has, has actively participated, will continue to. Uh, we have to have a say in it. After all, we are probably going to, our rate payers are going to be paying the bulk of what goes on there, especially the seen for the replenishment fee. Um, so participation is, 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 is going to continue to be very important for the Water District. 
Um, some of the key components that you were talking about, pumping allocations. As you've seen from the recent Prop 218 of pumping allocations that they were laid out, I, I think they need to be revisited. I think that I agree with some statements that have made, made by the GA in the past and some other things that all pumpers of water in this valley must share equally in the cost of what we are doing. Fees. I'm a firm believer that there's, there's actually three fees now. It's not three fees, but three separate, I, I would say, uh, expense items for the district, for the GA. One is uh, pre-plan. One is the replenishment fee for buying water. And the other one is administration fee. As you've, if you've heard any of the meetings, I've been actively requesting that we find a way to finance the administration of it. After all, the, the water district's role as general manager, finance, and clerk will end at the end of the year after two years of doing that. So we, ha we need to plan. That we, need, to have, we have to submit budgets by the end of the year. Water importation, I think it's important. I think we're going to have to look at it. There are probably only a couple ways that we can get water here, one from the north, one from the south. Both have their controversial issues to be addressed, but I think they can be addressed, but it's going to take teamwork between all the counties and all the, all the, the uh, uh, contractors of water involved, um, and it's local versus a regional solution. Uh, you know, that's a tough one. I, I think we need to look our, after ourselves as, as a local solution, but obviously there are regional issues that are going to have to be directed and looked at in the solution, including working with Inyo County, uh, LADWP, uh, possibly um, maybe one of the uh, contractors for the state water project. And role in funding is the water district is responsible, as you know, in, for the bulk of the funding, us in Cyril's Valley Minerals at this particular time. And, and so that we feel it's important that, as you've seen from my, my opening statement, that we continue to look for uh, water sources, whether it be working with the city for wastewater treatment, whether it be finding other sources of water, whether it be water banking, all those things are on the table. And I believe it's the responsibility of the water district as they sit on the GA board to continue to bring these forward. Although it is always going to be a fight, it's always going to be, um, you know, it's going to be one way or, 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 or I should say, my way or the highway in some cases, I think the water district needs to protect its ratepayers, protect the rest of the community, and find a way to get us to a sustainable process. Yes, the 7650 is there, and as Mallory said, it probably will continue to be until we find more data. We do know that, we can, that we're looking at about 5,000 acre feet a year. Where that comes from and how we get it here is, is what the contention is right now. Uh, and the water district, I can guarantee, are looking for any way they can to, to lower the amount of augmented water that they're going to use because that is the major cost that's going to be passed on to our ratepayers. Will it end in five years? I don't know. Uh, and will the water will the uh, water pumping fee end once we hit 1.5 million? By, I will make sure it does. It, we cannot go over that. It's a promise we made to the public. So again, the water will continue to participate. You're going to hear a lot of things from the district that maybe other people won't like, but we need to protect our valley. Thank you. Yeah, agree. Very complex uh, question, and, and thanks for the opportunity to um, address this. Uh, I didn't spend as much time on the groundwater authority supporting it as a technical in the technical uh, uh, committee as as Ron did, but uh, did get a lot of insights into why some of these decisions were made uh, and how some of these are fungible. Um, for the just a quick example, the 7650 is a starting point. Nobody in this room would, would ex suggest that 7650 is the exact amount of the annual recharge into this valley. But we're going to find out. And one of the ways we're going to find out is when we're forced to monitor how much water we're pulling out of the valley, monitor the average av well depth of wells and monitoring wells across the valley, and compare that to what we believe is coming in. We're going to start to refine a better and better understanding how much water is coming here, and I hope it's at least 7650. Uh, but these pumping allocations are going to have to be readdressed. We're already looking at uh, the Searles Valley component uh, out of the last GA. We saw uh, Mr. Gleason agree to, you know, uh, continue a dialogue with SVM on on uh, on their perceived access to uh, to the waters. Uh, fees. Nobody likes fees, but. <sighs> It's got to be paid from somehow, and until we find other sources and grants or other state resources or perhaps federal resources to help us offset the expenses of all what we're facing here, um, we got to get a leg up on this. 
Uh, water importation, uh, I'm very pro water importation. Uh, I think I might have been the only uh, uh, one that pre-election that came out in favor, strongly in favor of the fee. Um, I know there's a lot of questions that haven't been answered to everybody's satisfaction, but a lot of those questions, even the questions themselves aren't fully understood, much less the answers to the questions, and we've got to get started. The, the common denominator, though, on the, on what, how we're going to get the water here, how it's going to be stored, and all that, the common denominator is, is we need more water. So it makes sense to me to start a path to, to secure the water. Uh, <clears throat> I do believe, and I'm glad the Water District has made a commitment to stay with the GA. I think that's e essential. Uh, uh, local versus regional, I would read that to be how much do we uh, leverage uh, political support. Uh, and I know there is a, a reach out uh, right now uh, through uh, Capital Core to our political allies that are helping us understand what the resources might be to help pay for infrastructure that's required for whatever the option is that we choose uh, ultimately as the way of getting water in the valley. Uh, also regionally, of course, Inyo County uh, is essentially important to us, particularly if, if the sources of the water are going to originate from the uh, Eastern Sierra watershed north of us. Uh, there's been a lot of reluctance to embrace that, <clears throat> but there are some strategies. <clears throat> there are some strategies at which uh, Capital Corps believes we can convince or at least get Inyo County more on board with us uh, if we can show that we can replace the water that we would borrow from DWP in the Inyo Wells Valley. That's it. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> I'm going to say it like Ron, I probably need more time on this one. The, the Water District has actively participated in this effort, and I think it's very important that the Water District continues to be active in the Groundwater Authority. I believe that the Water District needs to have a stronger role in the Groundwater Authority. The Water District has asked for the last three years that I know of for a finance committee, and I think that has fallen on deaf ears. I think it's very important that the water district's role is one of most importance as they are one of the largest users. The, the fee right that was proposed that Mallory was talking about, the replenishment fee, the water district and Cyril's Valley Minerals are carrying the burden of that fee. And I disagree with that. I think it should be spread across all users. As far as the allocation goes, no, I do not think the allocations are fair. Um, I think the district got around 4,000 feet allocated so that fee is going to be charged to the district on any water above that so the water district customers are who are going to be paying this fee the I, I guess I disagree with the water importation um, I believe we have local solutions and we could have fixed this problem long ago if we would have sat at a table and talked and worked out a solution I'm not saying that we won't need water in the future but right now we have no way to get the water here. We have nowhere to store the water. We would have to build a treatment facility if we imported water unless we bought water from the Antelope Valley area that we brought AVAC, I believe is what it's called, because it's already treated. But if we did get water from the north out of the aqueduct, we would have to build the infrastructure. We would have to build a treatment facility. We would have to man the treatment facility. And we're talking millions and millions of dollars to do that. We have a solution locally to fix this problem, and it should have been done, and I believe that it could still be done. I think we should set down, buy the farms, use the water that they're using, run a line from North Inyo Kern to Inyo Kern Road, and then run a line from Bowman Road, South to Inyo Kern Road, blend the water, and then the TDCs would be low enough that we could use that water that they're using on the farms, we could drill a new well where we know the water table from the science and data that we've seen in the valley. The wells are coming up two to three feet out on the far end by Robber's Roost. And as you go further south, with the very south end of our subbasin, we have elevations of water that are higher. So we could drill a well and import that water from our own basin. 
the elevation of that water, we know from science and data, is higher than the water that is here. So there's a shelf if we look at the science and we look at the data. And so th we have a solution, but I believe egos have got in and we've said, okay, well, we've got these farms out here. We want them gone. And they have rights. Sigma did not change water law in California. The overlying user has the right to use the water under their ground. They were issued well permits. They have private property and they have a right to use the water until something changes. Um, so just to say, here's a fee you're going to pay. We're going to put out Searles Valley Minerals. We're going to put them out of business by fees. We're going to put the farmers out of business. Well, it, frankly, it pisses me off to see it happen. And that's where it, what is going on. The same thing is happening to me on the, through the Air Pollutions Board. It's all regulation. Drew can have the same pickup truck as me because he's personal with the same motor but I can't drive my truck because I have a business. And, and that's the kind of stuff that we're doing to these individual property owners. And so that's why I disagree with that. As far as getting water from the north, I think that's never going to happen. Inyo County voted no on the groundwater sustainability plan, and he said you will never get water from the north right here at our diocese when we had that meeting. So, okay, the last thing I'm going to say is it, it, the plan was sold on we're going to sell the water. We don't know what the value of the water is going to be at that given time. It's a commodity just like dirt's a commodity for me. If you don't have a place to store it, you don't have a customer, you can't sell it. If we fallow stuff, farms go fallow, we don't have a place to sell it. So I think it's a very bad plan. All right, thank you. Yes, very complex issue. I think in part of understanding this, we need to look at kind of how water moves in the ground. I mean, we only have so much. We assume that however much is down there, it is a finite amount. Water's always moving. It comes in from somewhere, and it generally keeps on going down the line and goes out somewhere. As we draw it out, it generally leaches from even the reservoirs or whatever and lowers the amount. Some of the studies have shown that the amount of water going into the ocean has reduced significantly, primarily based on a lot of these draws. What we have uh, with studies I've looked at is that the usage across the West has increased significantly because of an increased population. Some of those feeders that come from the east of us have done 500-year studies showing that if we, because you know, the 20th century was very wet, if we have one of the driest 100-year uh, periods, the water sustainability would be under 30%. And so um, whatever these studies mean in the long run, however it goes, increasing population, reduced potential flow of water here, all have indicated these problems. I do think we might be able to find some more sources of water, but ultimately I'm very concerned about the long term because it seems like if we really do have this issue with reduced water, that we call it water mining, we're going to have lower and lower amounts, and at some point in time, it's going to be a problem. I do think that these fees are difficult. They are not done fairly. We have different allocations that are not addressing, you know, like, like a de minimis math. We have some allocations for the number of people that are using this that don't match up with the allocation of water reserved for it. Are we planning on increasing the number of users there? I mean, there's a lot of hidden or unanswered questions, I think, throughout this plan. And I'm hoping that we can be a part in advocating that this money can be used at least for the proper purpose in ensuring a stable community. I think we need to start looking at options on what happens when, you know, if we lose a farm, if we lose Surly's Valley, you know, what are these places going to look like and how does that financially impact this community? And what are other solutions that can manage the water demand? From what we're looking at, we have a demand that increase or it exceeds three times the amount of the water recharge, even at that estimate which whatever rate it is at, it's going to change because water, it changes how it flows based on temperature, based on all these complex factors. Whatever rate it is today, it's going to be different tomorrow. So I think that we really need to make this a lot more transparent to the people, identify the options and the consequences, and kind of flesh out where we can change some of these things or advocate for at least a more fair and transparent outcome something that does take the community. I like the idea of the robber's roost thing. I do think that there's a lot of indications that we may have a good amount of water down in that area. I am hoping that we find enough to meet our need, but in the long run, we need to have a plan of what if it doesn't.
Mallory, you'll start our fourth question. And it's, given that under, under the groundwater sustainability plan, the cost of water will increase and the attendant ratepayers' water bill will rise, what are your ideas with regard to future rate structures to ensure fairness? You each will have three minutes to respond. I'm suspecting that the water district has some models that have been used in the past to come up with the different tier structures and rate structures that uh, go well beyond my current knowledge of uh, how they've arrived at fair distributions. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit at, at a, a disadvantage here, I guess, to address this issue directly. Uh, but I would suggest that uh, one of the things we're going to need to do is to help the ratepayers understand how they can reduce their water use so that these rate structures will be more attractive or at least reachable for them. Um, it's been estimated, uh, and I believe this came from the water district, but I'm not absolutely sure that the average cost due to the replenishment fee was going to go up on the order of something like $24 a month. Um, that will obviously impact some people a lot less than it impacts other people in the valley. Um, and I know we have hardships today that are handled uh, in some way or another. I'm not sure if there's uh, how those bill structures are stretched out. Uh, I don't have that insight into the uh, into the cost accounting within the uh, water district yet. Hope to be um, and hope to be able to contribute to that uh, if I'm elected. Um, that's all I have to say. The, uh, is, oops. Sorry about that. As far as, like Mallory said, it's, it's kind of a, a different question as far as establishing the rates. Uh, that's all done through a Prop 218 notice when the water district and they have a study done to figure out all of their cost analysis, what it costs to pump the water and everything else, um, and to, to deliver it. As, as far as the rate structures, I was a big advocate and still am a big advocate of the water costing the same to all customers. It's not that way currently. And depending on your meter size, the price of your water goes down or it doesn't actually go down. You get a, a larger usage. So if I have a three quarter inch meter at my house, I'm in a higher tier after I've used, I'm going to just use numbers, but 10 when somebody with a two inch meter can use a hundred at the lower tier price before they go into the different tiers. So the bigger your meter is, the more water you get at a cheaper price. So I'd, I've disagreed with that for a long time. If somebody uses a ton of water and they can buy it for a dollar 22 at the lowest tier rate, and I'm paying $5 at my house because I have a three quarter inch meter, I disagree with that. Um, the construction meters, is also an issue that I've had previously, and I am a contractor, so it kind of shoots myself in the foot, but I hate that a contractor or we have people that come here doing projects and other valleys that come in with their water trucks and they bring those trucks and they buy water from the district because it's cheaper to buy here than somewhere else out of a hydrant, and I have a problem with that. Um, I disagree with that, that we can sell it to somebody to truck it out of town cheaper than I can take a shower at my house because I've already used nine units of water, so I'm in the highest tier. So I think there's a lot of things we can do, but the district really doesn't have, I mean, the board does not actually set the rates. That's done through an independent study group that they come out and they figure out all of your cost. All the board does is votes on the type. If they wanna do tiers, if they wanna do a uniform cost across the board, so their hands are kind of tied that way. I guess that's it. All right. Um, I know the water is going to be increasing for everybody, and the structure is very complex. We have four different zones. In each of those zones, one through four, that determines some of the fees that you're going to pay. Within that, you have a tiered structure. You're going to be paying based on both the size of the pipe, like he said, and the amount of water you use. Um, I did actually the calculation on it, and if you're in the zone one and right now and you use one unit of water, you're paying more than 80% of the person who uses the nine units of water. 
And to me, that does feel like it gets a little unfair. What, uh, one thing that didn't get mentioned is the uh, pipe size. You do not get the benefit as a residential unit. So if you have a bigger pipe size, you still pay the highest tier as if you're in the smallest pipe size. So there's a lot of little nuances that don't always make sense. One of my things is infrastructure costs money, and part of the wear and tear on that infrastructure has to do with usage. So if it's a usage-based thing, we should try to address it within the tiered structure and ensure that we're actually you know, encouraging conservation of some form. When that cost structure, I think the actual crossover between each unit going up versus going down was somewhere around 42 units, even though the average usage is around 25. So we're in a position where it's like, is this really the position, is this really what we want to encourage residents to do? It's now cheaper for me to water the lawn, perhaps. There are also other structures that can help save in water that I think I would love to see encouraged, perhaps even with this process. One of the new things, I know that it's not necessarily the best technology, but Hydroloop. It is a water reutilization thing that can go in houses. It could even easily go within a new house for somewhere around $5,000 for a unit like that or something similar fairly easily at a comparable price. This can take your washing machine water, your bath. It can make it usable on the ground. It can make it usable for a bunch of secondary gray water source stuff in a way that allows us to have that water go further. I like the idea of being able to run some of my stuff, even a washing machine or you know bath water being reused. That, that seems like amazing. Now you don't have to worry about your five minute shower as much. You can reutilize that for other purposes. So I feel like as we incorporate these water bill increases, we can try to look for ways to accommodate these encouraged structure changes that will help benefit the community based on usage. We can encourage models that help reduce the burden and we can encourage a structure that does come across as more fair and transparent instead of having kind of a very complicated structure that's hard to determine whether I'm going to pay more or less this next month. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chuck is right. We do, we, we do rate studies. I believe one is due in two years. So a lot of things will be incorporated in that. I want to touch base on one thing. When you talk about, uh, let's stick to the question here about sustainable water plan and increase the water rates there. Um, uh, Mr. Mallory was correct uh, that you look at about an average of about $24 per month per average user. The average, I believe, is I'm going to use a round number, about 15 units, HCF. Many more people in small households use in a neighborhood of two or three or four. So when we talk about a $24 a month average, that's probably going to affect the higher users more than anybody else. And um, I would hope that would encourage some conservation as well. I know there's been a lot of talk about rolling all the rates into usage. But um, and as I said, in order to keep a sound infrastructure, and many districts have tried this, and our district, in fact, tried it, trying to roll everything into the rates itself, uh, nearly caused a bankruptcy problem. You have fixed costs. You have to maintain the system. Whether, whether you turn on that water or not, it just, to, just to have it available costs a certain amount of money, and that's always going to be there's a fixed cost. You can argue back and forth how much that is and how much you can put into usage. Um, increasing usage, does that increase conservation? Sometimes, but I think with the usage, what you've seen with the conservation of the district over, over like I said, over 30 percent since 2007, an average of t over 20 percent now since 2017, shows that our ratepayers take very seriously their use of water, and they will continue to do so. So what I'm saying is that when uh, the bill does look complicated, and I know that you have an arsenic fee, which is based on the capital cost for the arsenic plant itself, which was state mandated. You have a usage fee which is basically the usage of water based on a tier system. You also have the GA fee, which is the pass-through for the GA, which you're going to see. That's the one you're going to see go up to $0.24 cents per unit here starting this month. And then in January, add another $1.85 to that to, to bring us to almost at $24 per month cost on the average user. But, yes, rates can always be looked at, and you can always, there's all kinds of ideas that, that have come to, to, you know, there's base rates, there's base usage rates, and, and, and there's things like that, which uh, it turns out can actually you get a lot of water uh, for, for not much money in those systems. So I, I believe we did a good rate study. We have another one coming up in two years, and I think it's important that, we, that with all the information we're going to have in two years, including the cost to the groundwater sustainability plan, will all be rolled into that. Okay, thank you. Okay, question number five. Andrew, you'll start this question off. 
Reflecting on things like the future local economic growth in our community, the hardships rising from the current pandemic, the impacts of increased water rates, possible reduct, reduced uh, water district revenues, growing imports of sound water stewardship, etc. What do you see as the key characteristics of the Indian Wells Valley Water District in the future? In your term on the water board, what actions would you encourage to achieve this vision? You have three minutes. All right, thank you. Um, nice question. Uh, future growth. I think we want a sustainable future. And I think the increased water rates right on the heels of a pandemic and an earthquake and a huge bit of infrastructure hit, that, it, it's painful. I am hoping that we can come together as a community and try to seek some you know, collaboration that can help reduce some of that impact in the long term. I do believe that perhaps an infrastructure state, uh, state-based infrastructure project or a federal-based infrastructure project can be a critical long-term goal into maintaining some of that sustainability. I believe that it should be on the, on the table for many of the federal government interests as well as ours, as well as the state government. A water supply to this area, the whole southern region, could stabilize these fires. So you're talking billions of dollars that our people are claiming as damages. We can use that as a claim that this type of water infrastructure that stabilizes our supply also stabilizes these fire risks. It also stabilizes farming risks. It's just the idea of how much is it going to cost and can we make that something that the state or the federal government can be interested in, you know, being a collaborative partner on this. As opposed to the, uh, or looking at the state requirements for the limitations of water, I think we have some sober, sober times coming ahead, especially this starts hitting 2022 when this fee is likely going to impact us with more increases in water. We need to be very clear on the options that we have and try to do what we can to avoid a greater impact than has to be here. And I'm hoping that we can work with all partners to try to find those solutions that will basically avoid needless litigation. And I understand that some of it's probably inevitable, but we also have to understand that every time we jump down that route, that's more money that takes away from the solutions that we can be achieving and likely can harm this community. I think that sustainability idea, if we can find those collaborative solutions, and especially if we can find partners to come in on this with us, that can allow a stable future as is, as well as a growth potential. I think that would be the most exciting option. I think as we lay out the options, we also need to paint a picture of what happens if we don't have some of these good, feel good type solutions. How are we gonna manage the damages that are done? How are we gonna deal with the loss of funding as we lose infrastructure if that's the route we go? That way, with an understanding of these consequences and harms, we can really see the true value of coming together and trying to find those solutions that really work for this community. Thank you. Um, first of all, local economic growth. I firmly believe that we need to allow for economic growth in our community. Uh, number one, I believe the community needs to be an attractive community. I don't think that the base is going to be able to attract the type of personnel that they need here, along with families, unless we have a community that's attractive to live in. I believe that we have to plan for some growth. I, uh, the, the estimate of the war district was about 1% increase in usage on a yearly basis. Um, and that, that can be boiled down to numbers of families as well. So we are looking at growth. When it comes to uh, the pandemic, yes, the pandemic has put a, a huge hardship on us here. And we don't know when, know that's, when it's gonna end. That's why I fought hard to, to have a delay of some kind to, to look at the replenishment fee and where it's really headed. Uh, and not just because of the pandemic causing the economic hardship, but because of not being able to see the people in person. It goes to transparency. I think that we need to be as upfront with everybody and look them in the eye when we're making, having these discussions. Um, impact of increased water rates, we've talked about that a bit. It, it, there is an impact uh, and, and it, it's gonna happen. The, the average user at the $24, like I said, most users are probably in the you know, four to six range or something like that, but it is still an impact on those people. Um, reduced water uh, district revenues. I, I, I don't expect any because, you know, people are going to be using water. I think that, that you can expect a lot more conservation. Yes, we can always squeeze that sponge a little bit harder, 
But I think it's gonna be difficult again, based on the fact that we are using up to 9,000 acre feet, we're about 6,400 acre feet of the water district. That says a lot for this community and the ability to pull together to, for the good of the community. And I truly, truly appreciate that for everybody that gets water from the water district. Um, actions to encourage this vision, there, there's a number of them. One, one is uh, wastewater treatment. I think that it's important that the district stay involved with the city on their new plant so we can acquire that water to offset our augmentate, augmentation requirements for water. I think new sources of water, the, the district needs to look for other sources of water that, that may other people aren't looking at. I think as a district, we are an independent entity that we are able to do this and we should do this. We need to think outside the box. Is there other ways we can work with Inyo County? Is there other ways that we can work with Cerro's Valley Minerals? We need to think outside the box to solve that problem of the water that we need here. And we've got to be able to do that. Um, and, and we're capable of doing it. Uh, sometimes we get a lot of pushback on it, but believe me, the water district is, is, is an independent organization. We're here for our ratepayers. We, we need to keep the infrastructure strong. We need to find reliable water and water of our own. As far as rate structures go, again, we'll be visiting you know that very soon again and uh, take a good solid look at it. So, um, Reduce water district revenues, that one sort of bothers me. Yes, that can always happen. And let me tell you, it did happen when the district relied strictly on, 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 a, on a rate system which was on water usage. So we don't want to go there again. Thank you. We, we, indeed, <clears throat> excuse me. we indeed have some unique challenges that we're facing right now. Uh, I remain very optimistic that we will pull through these uh, as each one of these challenges uh, we're able to describe and we're going to find others and I think these challenges can by be decomposed into uh, the pieces that lead up to those particular issues um, just as an example and I, I don't mean this to be picking on any particular area in the community but we have lots of water hungry landscaping that serves no purpose but to look pretty. Uh, I'm not talking about parks. Parks have a purpose of serving kids playing and picnicking, but you know, why do we need grass areas along the uh, the, high, uh, the, uh, the main arteries in our city? Uh, why do we need so many uh, areas of uh, grassland that, that aren't usable? Um, and I would point out some right out in front of our building here. These are areas that would be easy water saving things that in aggregate across uh, our city and our local county uh, neighbors I think would lessen the blow a bit and help us take advantage of the recycling possibilities of the waste water treatment facility which has been estimated to perhaps yield between 1500 and 2000 acre feet of water since not everybody in the valley when they flush the toilet ends up in the WWF a lot of us flush into septic tanks which aren't retrieved that way but perhaps there's a way that we can expand the reach of the sewer system so the more of the water that currently goes into septic tanks ends up in the recycling facility that will ultimately hopefully soon uh, be put in line to help us take an edge off here uh, I've got another idea that I don't know how we do this but you know Searles Valley is he heavily dependent on water out of our valley if we could find a way to help them solve their own problem in their valley, perhaps with a brackish water treatment facility in, Searles, uh, in the Searles community, and lessen their 2,000 acre feet of water that they draw from our valley, that would be new water that we could claim and use towards the uh, growing deficit that we face today. We all know the increased price of water is going to drive some of agriculture out of the valley. Some think it's going to make it all go away. I don't know. But that's going to free up water as well, but not necessarily water that we're going to be able to use because Sigma is still going to say that we can only draw water out of our aquifer that equals the water recharge that we can currently measure and substantiate. So as long as there's an average level in our wells dropping, uh, as seen by, and the state's authorities are getting that data from us, then we're going to be held to a lower level of water withdrawal from the valley. Okay, we have uh, we were talking about an hour and a half, so we've got a little bit more. I still get to answer the question, don't I? <laughs> um, economic growth is very important. Uh, that is probably 
one of the top things we, we need to keep our town alive. Um, as Mallory said, there's a lot of grass, but it looks terrible. And that's my opinion when I drive through this town is it looks terrible. We've got to make our town look good. And people, water your trees. <laughs> um, water the trees. We've got to have the trees. So whatever we have to do to, I, I, I don't think we can ask the customers to save water any more than we have. As Ron said, they've re reduced so much. But if you drive on the base, it's green. There's grass everywhere. I was out there all day today. It's beautiful. It, it looks like a metropolis. I mean, it's just beautiful out there. So we have to work together to come up with a solution. And that solution is there. Now, Mallory mentioned Trona. And I've mentioned Trona before also. And I think it could be done. But I don't think Trona should have to foot all of the cost. I think it's important that San Bernardino County step up and take a active role and participate on the GSA by contributing some money. And they have not done that to date. So I think that's also an important thing to do. But we as a valley can look at, we have a line that goes to Trona that's been there for many years, but we could run a line back from Trona and export water from there and treat that water here as imported water if we build a desal plant. We have wells in a different basin that the Navy owns that's on that side of the mountain that we could tie into and run some water from there to here also to help supplement. And those are different basins and ideas that people haven't looked at. And I, I just think there's solutions if we look at the answers. Um, I, I do not see the water district having reduced revenues in the future. I, I think it's going to stay consistent. The water rates, though, I think $24 a month, I, I don't think that's going to hit any, or anybody close to that. I think it's going to be way more than that, and that scares me. I know on a construction, I, I figured out just my water meter cost. My average bill right now can be around $900 to $1,200 a month on my construction meter. It, it's going to be above $2,000 to $2,500 a month. So it's a large increase. And if people have farms, you know, animals, we have animals at our house. We have cows. We have chickens. We have sheep. And it's going to impact people more than just the average users. Ron said it's going to impact the larger users, and I am one of the larger users. But it's going to impact me very, very much. So I'm very concerned about how it's going to impact the people with this pandemic going on right now. I do not think it was a proper time to put this into place with everybody going through what they're going through in this valley. Thank you. Hey, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, and I think it's primarily because uh, we're missing. First alternative question is, the largest decline in water measurements in the basin are in the area of the waters district's southwest well field. How would you manage this to minimize the effects on domestic pumpers? You'll each have two minutes. It says three, but we'll do two tonight. It cut us to two, huh? Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know that that's actually a fact based on all the water district wells. It, it, the southwest is where most of the pumping goes because it's where the sweetest water is. There's no doubt about it. But the water district continually monitors all its wells. It also has air, wells, private wells in the area that we do mo we, we monitor as well to watch the effect. And, and yes, although it is it, uh, it is dropping, that uh, that a lot of it is due to the large pumping uh, by the, by farming in the southwest. So you know, one one solution is is that we look at spreading out our our pumping. But again, like I said, if, if that's a requirement that we do is 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 redrill to have additional pumping elsewhere. We're looking at millions of dollars, and that's why we need to stay economically sound at the water district. So if we are, uh, uh, I would say, mandated to do that by the GA because of spreading out pumping, uh, that it's something that we'd have to look at. But as this particular time goes, I don't want to speak to how far those wells are dropping. I, I, I believe they're minimal at this time, and, and of course we do shut some down in the wintertime as well. But I think our water monitoring that we do throughout the area is keeping a close eye on that. 
uh, again, we've had no domestic pumpers come forward to us to talk. I think there was one that talked about his, his well level dropping. So we have not had a number of them come to the water district, and, and we have been working with them and, and monitoring, like I said, certain wells in the domestic pumpers to see how they're affected. So, yes, that it, it, it can become an issue, but again, there's a lot of pumping that's going on on that one particular area. I want to touch a, uh, just a bit on, the, on what's called the southwest, the El Paso area. If, if people don't know this, uh, starting in November, December, there will be a, a test well dr uh, drilled in that area to look at what's going on in that area which is being paid for by DWR, and I believe it's gonna to go to the maximum depth of 1,500 feet. So we are looking for water in other locations as well to, to offset. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that uh, new well coming online, uh, Ron. I'm very excited to find out what kind of data we get from that. And uh, <clears throat> I think Stetson announced that well might be installed as early or beginning uh, early this this fall right we're going to start punching yeah so that would be nice to find out it'll it'll help us better understand uh, as it's going to be providing another monitoring capability across the valley exactly what's going on in our aquifer the models that came out of the uh, ground supportability plan uh, showed some very complex relationships uh, amongst the the uh, known water producing areas uh, across the valley and and there was some conflicting data that came uh, Ron mentioned the, the data is uh, uh, not as solid uh, that we could pick a number and know what it is but but there is some decline going on and how much and it, will that continue or does it get worse uh, we'll have to wait and see um, so what is the you know how do you manage the effects of this well spreading the spreading the the draw on water around the valley is one way to do that um, but we're running out of options of where to put those uh, those new wells uh, I might mention also I'm a little concerned about the increased uh, mineral content that we're seeing in some of our well sampled uh, in the latest data from Stetson but that doesn't seem to be happening in the southwest yet so um, uh, that's where I'll stop there. I, I, I'm going to agree with Ron as far as the measurements on the wells in the southwest on the decline. I, I don't know exactly the rate on those. Um, but if you look at our basin since the 1940s, our water table has been declining an average of six inches a year. It does not matter how much water we pumped. If you look at the charts and you follow the maps, it doesn't matter if ag started in 1971 and they started planting alfalfa and they started watering. The water table did not drop any more in 1972 than it did in 71, and it stayed consistent. We had pistachio trees planted. The water table is still continually dropped the same. So we have so our water is going somewhere besides just being in a bathtub, in my opinion. But... The water district has drill, drilled quite a few wells in the southwest. I don't know what farms were in the southwest that Ron had mentioned, except for I think there's two little farms out there. But there are farms on the other side of North Brown Road, and we know that if that water does not get pumped, there's a division line at Lee Lighter, and that water runs out to the playa and evaporates. We lose water because the standing groundwater on the base, it evaporates out there on the dry lake bed. So... The water district has a perfectly good well, and when I was a previous member of the board, they obtained a piece of property that had a very nice well drilled on it, and that was my objection to not using that well. They just chose to drill a new well within a half a mile of another well, and I was afraid of a cone of depression. Um, I don't think that's happened yet. I don't think there is a cone, but that was my concern. I believe the district could use the well that is existing and they should have put that into effect, and that's why I voted the way I did when that came up. But they have wells, and now I lost my train of thought because that stupid beeper. <laughs> um, 